Hello, this is Brian Kinghorn and I'm going to talk to you about where you should aim on the Matecell Frontier. And just to remind you, the Frontier is a graphical tool in Matecell to help you make decisions on balance between genetic gain on the y-axis and genetic diversity, where we want to be towards the left, on the x-axis. We've talked about some fundamentals of this Frontier. Today we're going to talk about where you should aim, and then the next video is balance strategies to help you target where you want to aim. And this is a problem for everyone, not just mate cell users. So the balance between genetic gain and genetic diversity is not a mate cell problem, but mate cell does provide you a way of handling it. First of all, I'm going to talk about making a frontier which is appropriate for you to make the decisions on where to aim. Then we'll talk a bit about your place in your industry and how that impacts on where you might aim. And lastly, we're interested in looking at the long term. What are the likely impacts of your decisions on where to go on the frontier and how to balance short term and long term genetic gains? So first of all, how to make an appropriate frontier. This is the Matecell Classic demo it has come to a halt at the usual familiar place of 25 target degrees. This is zero degrees. This is 90 degrees. And the frontier has been built by pushing outwards as much as possible with separate little mate cell runs in order to see how far you can go in each direction. In this particular case, we're using a very simple run without grouping or reproductive technologies. And mate cell, as you can see here, has used truncation selection for this point. So for my illustrations, I'm going to use a grouping strategy instead. So if we go to grouping, uh, T is enough to turn that into true. And what I want to illustrate is what happens if you don't converge well towards the frontier and you do very little work in that direction. So let's make that run. So the frontier was built very quickly. These points of 90 degrees and 0 degrees are not well converged. We're still going for 25 degrees and there it is. And that's where we've ended up. But it's a bad place to be. It's not representative of 25 degrees and let me illustrate that by saying let's now go for zero degrees and that's going to push forward the frontier in that area. So let's do that now. Look at this point here and you can see this is where we were over here. So this is what we thought was 25 degrees. Now we've pushed and made a better frontier and made cell does this dynamically. And so if I now go for 25 degrees on what is a more correct frontier, although what I should do is do the same for 90 degrees, but we don't have time for that perhaps. If I update, so the difference between this 25 degrees and that one is quite dramatic. So the whole point here is to be sure that you do make reasonably good convergence in building your frontier. Don't do anything daft like this. That was just for illustration. And now I want to make a different point. I can quite easily reset this by reopening the file, Matecell Classic Demo, and I'll open up this file here, imp1 group, because we're not going to be doing grouping now. And what I want to illustrate here is the point that you should not second guess what's best to do and put in constraints on maximum use, for example, which might be something you find in a textbook about what's good for your species in terms of, for example, the maximum number of matings to give to a male. So let's save that and I'll make a run and a frontier will build. I'm now going to set the direction to zero degrees. So we're going for maximum genetic gain. Okay, so I'm going to stop the run. And if we now go over to our data set and look at outmatings.txt, that's the new mating list. What I can do, there's a number of ways of doing this, but I'm just going to copy all that and go to the file called import solution and replace all that information in there and save it. So what I've done is I've saved this solution here in import solution.txt. Now what I'm going to do is go back to this file and look at what happens if we allow what might be, shall we say, the biological limit or a practical limit and what you could achieve for the maximum use for number of females per male, basically. So what I'm now going to do is do that run. And when we've let that settle where it is, I'm going to import our previous solution. And there it is. And so just to review that, this is the place we get to if we allow males to be used for 25 matings. And this is where we get to if we allow them only to be used for 10 matings. And this might be done, and I find often is done, 
by those who read a textbook and say, well, this is what you should do to manage inbreeding. But let's look at what we've got here. The frontier for this previous run probably runs something as to where my mouse is going here. And that is the maximum gain that you could make. However, by using males more, we would end up having a lot less genetic diversity if we went here, but we could also be at the same point and yet have this much more genetic gain. Or we could be at the same level of gain and have this much more genetic diversity by allowing mate cell to do its work. So you might ask how come we allow males to have more matings, that's 25, and yet achieve the same level of diversity and get more gain. Well, basically what's happening there is that mate cell is allowing the very high index animals to have more matings and is making compensations elsewhere in the breeding program by spreading the use over a greater number of males and overall giving you this better result. And this is what's called optimal contributions and it is what is giving us this extra result towards the frontier, either more gain or more diversity. So now we want to move on to look at your place in your industry. And there are two components I'll talk about here. One dare to be different, where by having more conservative approach aiming here and also by having candidates that are quite different to what everyone else is using, that you can make some compromise in genetic gain, but have more diverse a portfolio, which in the long run may be valuable to you for selling animals which are of different bloodlines and less related to the mainstream in the population. I've seen this work in particular for one breeder who is very progressive and he's made a success out of being different and yet competitive. The next one, open or close to imports. If you are, for example, a poultry breeder and you've got some excellent line, you want, probably want to be more conservative and conserve more genetic diversity because if you did lose genetic diversity and you had to import stock from the outside to alleviate that, that you'd make too big a compromise because you're so far ahead of everyone else. So that's one reason for you to be more conservative. On the other hand, if you're still quite a good breeder, but there are lots of others out there who are quite competitive as well, then you might be more aggressive and aim more up in this direction because you do have the opportunity, if you do get into trouble with lack of genetic variation, you can import from those other breeders and not suffer too much in genetic merit. So I'll make this a little bit more clear with the following example, which comes from Mario Suntama, uh, working with trees. And if we look at the frontier and we have different policies, if we have this aggressive policy, then what's going to happen is that our levels of co-ancestry and inbreeding are going to progress more quickly and you're going to get into danger more quickly. Whereas if you have more conservative approaches, you get into danger with inbreeding less quickly. So why is it important to keep inbreeding down? Well, what's important is the genetic gain we have in the long run. And this aggressive policy here means that you have more inbreeding, less genetic variation, and you run out of steam in your breeding program. If we look over here, it's not the best policy in the long run. The best policy in this particular work was at 25 degrees, and here it is in the long run, better gains. And these other policies were reasonably competitive, possibly for the long run, for this 45 degrees, and 60 degree conservative policy was never competitive in this time frame. So that's been a discussion about your place in the industry and how where you aim on the frontier is likely to impact long-term genetic diversity and genetic gains. What I want to do now is look at the co-ancestry measure on the x-axis of the frontier and ask, well, can't we just look at those numbers and use them to make a sensible decision about managing diversity? Well, unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as that. What we can do is look at the range and values, and as in this case, when there is quite a considerable amount of range, then we know that diversity is likely to be important, and if there's a small range, then it's less important. When we do that, we have to take account of the fact that we may, for example, have used reproductive biology in order to allow many matings per cow, for example, through IVF. On the other hand, we may or may not have cast the net quite widely to have access to candidates from further afield, which might give you the potential for greater diversity. So having taken account of those things, you can get a little bit of a feel for the importance of diversity by looking at the range of figures you've got there. However, this is a difficult area and it's very difficult to make a sensible decision based on those numbers. If you want to get a theoretical prediction of what's going to happen in the future as a function of the design of your breeding program, 
then I could recommend that you go and look at this work from John Williams, Peter Baima, and Beatrice Villanova, and the work of them and others to produce the software Cell Action, where you can enter the design and parameters for your program and get a feel for what the long-term impacts will be on genetic gain and genetic diversity. What I want to do now is to look at measuring past rates of inbreeding and loss of diversity, and that does give us some feel for the current issues. So co-ancestry, as we use it here, denoted by little f. If we take an element from the numerator relationship matrix and divide it by two, that is actually the inbreeding coefficient that we will get in the progeny between those two animals. And that just illustrates why we divide it by two. Now, little f co-ancestry is equal to inbreeding under the restrictive conditions that we have self-fertilization and random allocation of mates. Uh, of course, that doesn't happen in most animal and plant breeding programs, but I'll refer to that and illustrate why that is the case in a later slide. However, little f does not measure the change in diversity, and that's really what we're after. It's not so much how much diversity you've got now, it's how much change you can have in the future, and you want to reduce that to maintain diversity. So we need a measure of change in parental co-ancestry to help us to conserve genetic diversity in the long run. So here is such a measure, and it looks very similar to this one here, which is operating on inbreeding coefficients. And in fact, asymptotically in the long run, they are about equal to each other. And in both cases, it's a question of looking at the inbreeding coefficient change over a period of time and looking at that in relation to how much inbreeding there is left to go. And in the case of inbreeding, it's very easy to work and track because F is a property of individual animals, we can plot the animal's inbreeding coefficient versus their birth date. And there we see the trend in inbreeding coefficient and in fact, a measure of decrease in diversity over time. However, co-ancestries are a function of groups of animals and therefore we need to decide the time period. And this becomes a much more difficult thing to get a handle on. So why can't we just use the inbreeding coefficient to measure what's happened in the past or the recent past in particular? And that is difficult because inbreeding coefficient is heavily influenced by the pattern of mate allocation. So if you start using mate cell on your breeding population, you might find that inbreeding coefficients go down quite a bit, but that doesn't mean that diversity has gone up. It's just because you have reduced the inbreeding coefficients through finding less related mating pairs. So let's have a look at those two things one more time. Little f co-ancestry, big F inbreeding coefficient. There is a section in the manual called the two inbreedings, which gives some contrast of those. But let me just show something here with a spreadsheet that you've probably seen before if you looked at the appropriate video. Here we've got a situation where we have the elements on the frontier, which is the y-axis x prime g, progeny merit, and co-ancestry, I haven't divided it by two here, just for simplicity, but it's x prime ax, and there it is laid out for you. And in this case, we're just using one male and one female with a half contribution each to the next generation. And if we look over here, we can see that male and that female, which is number one and number three animal, are not related to each other according to their numerator relationship matrix. And that means when we mate those two animals together, their progeny will be totally not inbred. However, in the future, we're going to have problems because we've got such a narrow genetic base. And that means that long-term inbreeding is going to be quite large. When we mate those two individuals, the whole of the next generation are going to be full sibs to each other and we cannot avoid full sib matings. And we are setting ourselves up for inbreeding problems in the long run. So short-term inbreeding zero, long-term inbreeding big. So they're not the same thing. However, if we had self-fertilization, and random mate allocation, then half of the progeny would be full sibs, but the other half would be from self matings. And so immediately in the next generation, we would have high levels of inbreeding. And that's where co-ancestry and inbreeding coefficient would be the same under that restricted circumstance. Okay, so now we're going to move on to look at measuring the future rate of inbreeding or loss of diversity. Well, one way of doing that is to run your breeding program for 20 years or 50 years and look back and measure what happened. But we can do something a bit more cheeky than that. And we can simulate ahead. So this is a program which you have parameters for the population structure and various other things. And what we can do is just run that over a period of time. In this case, I think it's 50 years. And it's not even five minutes. It'll do it in less than one minute. 
So here we're looking at phenotype for trait 2. And we see that we get off to a great start and there's progress in the population, but it does tend to run out rather quickly. Why is that? Well, if we plot inbreeding over time, that's the plot of inbreeding coefficient over time, it's very similar over time to the amount of co-ancestry we have in the population, and that is a reflection of genetic diversity disappearing. And that's why we find that the response to selection is decreasing, because there's little diversity, animals are tending to look very similar to each other, and there's little genetic variation. So all we need to do is run these simulations under different policies, and in this simulation, all the breeding decisions have been made by the production version of mate cell, so you can directly run mate cell parameters as according to your policy and look at the predicted impact. It's actually a realized impact in the simulation on genetic gain and, of course, also genetic diversity. And that is what's used by many breeding companies and, and people running progressive breeding programs to help them have some confidence about the places to aim on the frontier, taking account of the fact that they may be importing stock as well during the period of time involved. And of course, it's not just the issues of genetic gain and genetic diversity. You can look at the impact of having different patterns of marker management and trait management and what that does for the long-term outcomes and how you target the outcomes that you're looking for. So ideally, you would do these sorts of things to have confidence about where you're going, but that's rather difficult in many cases. So I'll just finish by making some general observations about where to target on the frontier. And that is that wherever you go, if you look at the pattern of use of animals, it's all very sensible in terms of managing diversity and doing the right thing. The sorts of things that you would do in the old days if you tried to manage the use of animals appropriately for inbreeding, but it does a bit better by using optimal contributions to get towards the frontier. So in general, if you want to be aggressive, you can be up here. If you want to be middling, you can be here. If you want to be conservative, you can be here. And if genetic merit is not such a big issue, if you're breeding zoo animals, then you might want to be down here. You should also pay attention to the shape of the frontier, and we'll talk about that in the next video. So let's come to the end of this video on where I should aim. And where you should aim is very much your decision, and it's a very important one. So you should spend some time thinking about it. The next video is working with balance strategies, and that will help you to achieve where you want to aim on the frontier. So thank you for listening.